Well, hey everyone, uh, my name is Samson. I'm the pastor of adult ministries here. Um, and I'm just so excited to be here with you. Um, and uh, just for those of you who are in Guthrie right now, Pastor Rodney is there in Guthrie with you. So watch out, he's somewhere there. Uh, but, uh, but obviously, I'm glad, glad, so glad to be in this series and, and being able to talk to you. Uh, before I get uh, into the series, um, I want to do something a little bit different. Uh, you know, this weekend can sometimes be about uh, going out to the lake or getting on a, getting a good sail going or, you know, hanging out with family. But, but really what this weekend uh, is about is about celebrating uh, and honoring the lives of those who lay down their life willingly uh, for the sake of our country. Um, and so here's what I would like to do. Uh, if you were active or were active military, um, or if your families of those individuals, or if you have a loved one uh, that gave their life in service to our country, would you just stand up right now? Just go ahead and stand up. There we go. Uh, we are in a series called You Asked For It, and all through the series we've been answering the questions that you have asked uh, back in Easter, and so kind of throughout the weeks, uh, Pastor's been kind of answering those questions. Last week, Pastor Clint answered the question about singleness, marriage, and divorce. It was a great talk, uh, and this week, I'm answering the question about money. Money, I know. Like, I, I drew the short straw on that one, Okay. Uh, now, here's the thing. Uh, I, I wanted to get some uh, feedback from people out in the real world. So I went on Facebook this last week, and I asked a question about money. This is what I asked. Um, I said, what would you do if someone gave you $100 today? And I just want to kind of throw it out there to see what people would say. I had no, no ulterior motives here. And, and here's some of the responses that I got. Uh, one person said, give it to me and I'll tell you. <laughs> and uh, no joke, a uh, number of people this week had, have come up to me and said, so who are you giving the $100 to? And I'm like, no one. I, I don't have $100 to give to anybody. Uh, it wasn't a competition. It's just a question. Um, here is the uh, next one. Uh, my friend Dustin says, ask them why, then refuse the gift out of mistrust friend Dustin uh, deals with a lot of trust issues, I can tell. Uh, my brother-in-law, Jason, said this. He says, give it to my pastor. Now, I just want to give you a little uh, info there. Uh, Jason is actually the pastor of his church. <laughs> so it's a little bias with him. Uh, here's another good one. Ashley says this, ask why, then give it back. The only thing free in life is Jesus. Woot, woot. Hashtag Jesus. Hashtag blessed. Uh, and that is what we call in the Christian world as a Jesus juke. That's when someone has like an honest question and you juke them with Jesus, okay? Uh, here is, here's my friend David. David said, eat out at a nice place like Arby's. <laughs> Come on, he's going to eat good at Arby's. All right, here's, here's my favorite one. Uh, Kirsten says, I'd give it to this great guy I know named Samson. Uh, so that was my favorite one, and if I was giving away $100, it would be to her, okay? <laughs> uh, so uh, here's the thing, though. I I'm not here trying to tell you what I think you should do with your money or even what my friends on Facebook think you should do with your money. What, what I really want to talk about is what Jesus thinks we should do with our money, right? Because uh, it it's important to know what his perspective is because in all reality, Jesus owns everything, right? The Bible says that the cattle on a thousand hills belong to God, that literally they lived in an agrarian society, so that literally what Jesus, what the Bible was trying to say is that everything in the world, all the wealth in the world belongs to God. And so if he owns everything, then it seems like he has a pretty imp important opinion on what we should do with it. So here is what Jesus has to say. If you have your Bibles, uh, Grab it and turn with me to Matthew chapter 6. Uh, we're going to look at verse 19 down. Matthew chapter 6, verse 19 down. And it says this, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth 
where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys, where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Verse 22, Jesus says, The eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body is full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? Lastly, Jesus says this, verse 24, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God, and say it with me, money. You cannot serve God in money. A few weeks ago, I was in a hospital waiting room uh, with some good friends. Uh, one of my dear friends was in surgery, uh, having an open heart surgery being performed on him. And while we were waiting there, uh, ba basically every, every hour, the surgeon would call in and give the family an update. And I remember every time that phone would ring, uh, our hearts would race just a little bit uh, until we found out that everything was moving smoothly. And I walked away that day with this real understanding that the heart is such a vital part of our, of our body. And I, and I always knew that, but it felt like that day it just became that much more real. Like there's certain parts of our body, if we were to cut off our arm or our leg, we can still have a normal life. But if we didn't have a heart, then we couldn't live. And so when Jesus talks about money, what does he equate money to? What does he bring in to show us the importance of money? Our heart. Our heart, the most vital part of us. And, and when Jesus was talking about the heart, he wasn't talking about the thing that pumps blood in your chest. Jesus was talking about the most intrinsic part of who you are. You at your very core. That is your heart. And Jesus says, when, when I deal with money, the reality is people need to know that money has everything to do with your heart. Who you are at the core. Your heart. So today as we look at this passage, uh, I think we're going to realize three questions uh, that Jesus wants us to ask concerning our heart in relation to money. He's going to ask us to think, to consider, first off, where is our heart, what's in it, and who rules it? Where is our heart, what's in it, and who rules it? So let's look at the first question that Jesus asked of us, and that's this, where is my heart? Where is my heart? Jesus says this. He says, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on this earth, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. And, and in doing this, Jesus is laying kind of this, uh, this dichotomy out for us, right? This, these two worlds before us. He says, on one side, here is the world. And the world is temporal, meaning that it is subject to time. It's temporary. It is subject to decay. And on the other side, there is heaven, eternity. It is not subject to time. It is not subject to decay. It is forever. And Jesus says, you know, when you spend your money, and, and for Jesus, you don't really spend your money. You invest your money. He says when you invest your money, you can either, you can either invest it into things that are temporary or you can invest it into things that are eternal. And we live right smack dab in the middle between these two choices, these two worlds. And we get to pick where we invest our money. And if you're anything like me and that new iPhone comes out and you're like, oh my gosh, I really want that, right? And you're sucked in to the temporary world. Or, or maybe you're saying, man, I got to go, and th th that sale is coming out. It's going to be so good. I got to go and invest my money there. Or, or maybe you're like, hey, I, just, I love that new car smell. I got to invest in a new car. Now, I will tell you that new car smell can be purchased, just the smell. <laughs> but, but the reality is every time we spend money on those things, Jesus, we're not really spending money. We're investing 
money. And, and what matters is not so much the money that we're investing, but this is what Jesus, he says, wherever you invest your money, guess what follows? Your heart. Your heart. And so he says, wherever you put your treasure, wherever you invest your treasures, your heart is sure to be right there. So the real question is not where's your money. The real question is where is your heart? Where is your heart? How many of you guys have seen uh, Willy Wonka in the Chocolate Factory growing up? Yeah? Right? And I'm not talking about the scary Johnny Depp version. Uh, I'm talking about the Gene Wilder, the old one, the, the classic. And that was the one I grew up with as a kid. And, and if you know the story, you know the story is about a kid named Charlie who wins a golden ticket with another group of kids. And they are all basically allowed to go on this tour of Willy Wonka's chocolate factory. And so as a kid, he's touring this factory. And the kids don't know it yet. But basically what Willy Wonka is going to do is at the end of the tour, he's going to give away his factory. He's going to make an heir out of the, the one kid who shows himself worthy of, some, of, of receiving the factory, essentially. And so it's pretty interesting. As the story goes, you see all these little kids, and they're constantly tempted by all the little things in the factory. You guys remember Augustus Gloop? Augustus loved chocolate. And when he sees this lake of chocolate, what does he do? He just dives in. And he's swimming around. Eventually he gets sucked up into this tube, and then he's gone. Right? And then the next kid, uh, she sees this, this experimental candy that no one's eaten yet. She grabs it, she eats it, and she turns into a giant berry. And then the, the, the next kid, uh, they see a, a, a goose that lays a golden egg, and she wants that goose. She wants that egg so bad, she and her dad go chase after the thing, and they fall into a tube, and they fall into the furnace, and they disappear. You know, for a kid's movie, there's a lot of kids disappearing. And I remember watching this movie as a kid, and I would think, you know, why can't the kids just hold off a little bit? Because if they just resist the urge for these little pits, pits and pieces, the little candies here or whatever, then they can get the whole factory at the end. And the reality is that's the way we live our lives so often. We're so invested in the temporary world. We're so invested in all of these things that the world seems to offer that is subject to decay, that is subject to time, and we forget that all the way over here that God has something even greater in eternity. But our heart, our heart is lost in stuff. You know, Jesus is not trying to get your stuff. Hear this. Jesus isn't trying to get your stuff. He's trying to get to make sure your stuff doesn't get you. He isn't trying to get your stuff. He's trying to make sure your stuff doesn't get you. So the question is, where is your heart? Is it tied up in stuff? Or is it set on eternity? Second question that Jesus asks of our hearts is this. What is in my heart? So the first question is, where is it? Now Jesus wants to know what's in it. What's in it? He says this. He says, the eye is the lamp of the body. If your eye is healthy, your whole body is full of light. If your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. You know, and it's it's actually really interesting because when I was reading this passage, it seems like Jesus had something really cool to say about money up at the very top when he says wherever your heart is your, or wherever your treasure is, there's your heart. And then at the bottom where he says you can't serve two masters, that, that all seems to do, you know, say something about money. But right in the middle here, Jesus has this whole confusing spiel about eyeballs. Like what is he trying to communicate? If you're like me, you're, you're honest with it, you're like, man, that is confusing. What is Jesus trying to say? So as I was researching this uh, I found out that in Jesus' day, uh, there was a, a saint. Uh, they would look at someone and, and they would say, uh, they would look at him and say, oh, he has, he has a good eye. And what that saying meant was that that person was a generous person. Or they would look at someone and say, ah, oh, he has an evil eye. And what that meant was that they were a selfish or greedy person. 
And so here is what Jesus do. Jesus is playing off of their saying, the idiom of their day. And Jesus is creating a whole sermon out of it. He says, listen, if you have a good eye, if your eye is healthy, as you say, then you'll be generous. And if you're generous, you'll have all this light in your heart, in your life. But if you have an evil eye, and your eyes are closed off to the needs of people around you, and you can't see, and all you see is darkness, your whole life is full of darkness. And he invites us to be people whose eyes are healthy, who are generous, who are looking for ways to be generous, to give. Um, When Hope and I, my wife and I, started our journey towards financial freedom, um, you know, one of the things that we had to start uh, a little over a year ago is we had to start out with this thing called a budget. Have you guys heard of that? Yeah, it sucks. Let's be honest with you guys, okay? Because before the budget thing, everything seemed to be great. And then after the budget, we had to, like, tie down everything. And so we're thinking of ways that we can be extreme. And we were pretty extreme with our budget. And uh, hope came to me one day, and she said, Samson, I feel like God is telling me that I need to fast shopping. And I looked at her and said, you know, like, like shopping for groceries or? And she says, no, 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 I need to shop. I need to fast shopping for clothes, for accessories, for shoes, those kind of things. I said, okay, so are you going to do that for like a week or a month? She says, no, I feel like God is telling me I need to fast shopping for a year. And so after she resuscitated me off the floor, I said, are you sure about that? That sounds crazy. And she says, no, I am absolutely sure that this is what God's put on my heart. I said, okay. So over the last year, she has not gone shopping at all. Uh, That was last April. So coming towards the end of this past April, um, she, you know, we knew that she was kind of coming at the end of her fast. And so I looked at her and said, babe, so what are you going to go and buy? Like, what are you going to do? And she's like, I don't know. Um, But but she had a commitment in her heart. See, we had made this budget, and we were going to stick to our budget no matter what. And so, you know, her fast ending and going on the shopping spree can't mean that we're going to break our budget as a result. And so what we decided, or what she decided, was that she was going to go around the house, find random things that we don't ever use, and sell it. And whatever she makes, she's going to use for her shopping spree. And so she sold random, she, we had a five-year-old computer that nobody wanted, and we had some uh, furniture that we never touched, and so she sold out, made like three, four hundred bucks. Like, I was blown away by the fact that she was able to sell those things. And, and she made all this money, and, and I could tell she was excited about the shopping spree that was going to come at the end of her fast. And so I said, babe, let me take you out shopping. I'd love to be there with you whenever you get to break your fast officially. And so we spent a whole day going in and out of various stores. Um, And at the end of the day, after going through all these stores, you know how many things she bought? Zero. And I was a little frustrated. I said, why didn't you buy anything? And she says, I don't know. It just didn't feel right. Like, it just wasn't the right time. I'm just going to hold off for a little bit longer. And I said, okay, we'll just hold off. A few weeks later, it was my birthday. I was turning 30 years old. Uh, and she asked me, what do you want to do for your 30th birthday? Like, what do you want as a gift? And I said, well, here's the thing. I, I don't want a gift uh, this year. I actually just want to get together with some friends and just, you know, like, I don't want you to spend money on me. I want to stick to our budget. That's the thing. She said, okay. And so one day I walk into my 30th birthday party, uh, and I'm just blown away by everything that she has set up from all the friends that she's invited uh, to all the gifts that she's bought for me. And, and I have to be honest with you, at the, in the back of my head, as happy as I was, in the back of my head, I was like, how much did all this cost? You know what I'm saying? And so at the end of the night, I looked at Hope and I said, Hope, I'm so grateful for what you've done, and I don't want this to sound at all a negative thing. I just have to ask, where do we get the money for all this? And she looked at me and she said, you know that shopping spree I was saving up for? That wasn't a shopping spree for me. I was saving up for your birthday. 
You know, 10 years from now, I may not remember anything that I got for my 30th birthday, but I'll never forget the sacrifice that she made, the way that she gave. Her generosity brought a light into our marriage. It was like literally she walked into a room and she turned on the light, and I got to see her in a whole new different way. I got to see our marriage in a whole new different way. And that's what generosity does. When you look at the world and you don't say, how much can I get? But you say, how much can I give? It completely changes your perspective. Your whole world is lit up by a world of possibilities. And here's why. See, when you're caught up with the world of the temporary, you know what happens? You're caught up in the reality of that world. Because you have a limited amount of time. You have a limited amount of resources. Why would you give that away? You would want to keep that for yourself. But if you knew that your world is far bigger, your eternity is far bigger than that, then why wouldn't you want to give that away? Your eyes would be wide open to see how can I give, not how can I take. So Jesus asks, Not only where is your heart, but what's in it? Is it lit up with generosity or is it darkened by selfishness? Where is your heart? What's in it? And here's the last question that Jesus asks. Who rules my heart? Who rules my heart? Jesus says this. uh, No man, no one can serve two masters. You'll either serve God or you'll serve money, but you can't serve both. And I was trying to think of a way where I can illustrate what it looks like to serve God versus what it looks like to serve money. Um, And it ultimately led me to our story. Uh, Hope and I uh, began our marriage uh, with the intent that we were going to pay down our debt and, and move towards financial freedom. Uh, except we had two very different ideas of what that would look like. Uh, she had a very aggressive perspective on how we would pay down debt, and I had the right perspective. <laughs> and so, so when we got married, we started our, out our marriage uh, with a lot of arguments concerning money. And every time the topic of money would come up, uh, we would... We would fight, we would argue, and we would just never come to an agreement. It was like the the 900-pound gorilla in the room. And we would just hate bringing up the topic. And whoever brought it up, it was like you were going to walk up to the gorilla, open the cage, and let the crazy out. And it was like a game of chicken. Who was going to do it first? And I remember uh, one day, uh, I wanted to buy a camera, and so I was just talking to her about it, And and she's like, okay, well, if you're going to do that, then we really need to sit down uh, and talk about the money. We need to talk about the debt. And I remember I got so angry, I got frustrated, and eventually we both just, the whole situation elevated, if you know what I mean. (laughs) And I just said, I I can't be here with you right now. I just just need to leave, I need to drive, I need to be not here. So I'm driving away, I'm thinking about all the reasons why I'm right and why she's wrong. But the reality is we had this huge, huge debt problem. And I'll tell you how much. We were in debt, $94,536, I'm sorry, $94,536.82 excruciating cents. About 92000 of that was my student loans. And I just always assumed it would just kind of be with me. It would be like a pet that I just kind of kept on the side. No big deal. And as I was driving, I could feel God working in my heart. And he was pushing me to make some changes, but I wasn't ready. Later that week, I downloaded this book um, by a guy named Dave Ramsey called Total Money Makeover. And uh, I downloaded the audio book, and I had my headphones on, and I was mowing the lawn. So I was doing two things that I hate, listening to a book about money and mowing the lawn. So I was like this grouchy person mowing the lawn. And God began to speak in my heart. 
And I must have mowed the lawn like five times over that day listening to that book. I couldn't stop. I was working on my heart. And at that point, I knew I was wrong. And I knew that she was right. I wish I could tell you that I walked in and immediately told Hope that. I didn't. There was this thing called pride working in my heart. And so I just kind of let it lie. A few weeks later, I was going on a trip um, with some, a group of guys and where I went and drove all the way to Texas. And I was driving back, and so I had these long car rides. And all the way there and all the way back, all I could think about was this. And the Holy Spirit was working on my heart. And I finally knew I had to have the conversation. So I came home, I sat down with my wife, and I said, Hope, God's been working on my heart. And I know that we have to deal with this debt, and we have to be aggressive. And you're right. And the whole time, she's got tears welling up in her eyes. See, what I didn't know is back when we had that one argument, the one where I walked out of the house and I was angry at her, back then she prayed this prayer to God. And she said, God, I I don't want to bring this up anymore. In fact, I won't bring it up if you will just talk to him. And so from that moment, she never brought it up. And she was just praying in the background, waiting for God to work on my heart. And this whole time, guess who was working on my heart? God. And so that week... We emptied out our savings account and we dumped all that money towards debt. And we started off on a journey towards financial freedom. Over the last year and a half, we've paid down $67,971.68 excruciating cents. And it's painful to say that that does not include interest. Today we owe $26,565.14. We're still on our way. Our goal is January of 2018. We're still on that path. We don't have it all figured out, but we know that if we stick to our budget, we do the right things, we serve God, it'll all work out. And... uh, You know, it's so interesting. Every time we tell people that story, um, there are people always kind of blown away, and they say, man, you must have, like, must have done nothing. You must have been bored. You couldn't spend money on anything. You know, you couldn't give money. You couldn't do anything. And and the reality is that wasn't true at all. Um, We still loved and enjoyed our first year of marriage. In fact, we had a ton of fun in that whole process. We had some very awesome, creative vacations that we enjoyed And God blessed us all throughout that journey. But what I loved the most was at the uh, kind of the end of the year when I was doing the taxes, and you're looking at the charitable giving area, that little box, and I had this realization that we had given the most we had ever given towards the kingdom in the year that we had paid the most we had ever paid towards financial freedom. We're just blown away. And every time I think and look at those numbers, it's like it doesn't even make any sense. Like it doesn't add up. Every time we gave, somehow God provided. And time after time again, we got to see God's faithfulness. He was in the process with us. And he was reminding us that this world is so much bigger than over here in the temporary that if if we would be on this journey, investing in the eternal, that he'll take care of the temporary, that he'll take care of all the issues of this world. That's what Jesus goes on to say in his sermon about money. Jesus says this, he says, no one can serve two masters for either he will hate one, love the other, be devoted to one or despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. We know that part. Verse 25, he says this, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you'll eat or what you'll drink or about your body, what you'll put on. Is life not more than food, and body not more than clothing? And what Jesus is trying to point out is this, 
that a lot of times, really, when you pursue money, what you end up with is worry. When you pursue money, you end up with worry. And what Jesus is trying to say is, no, you don't have to have that. And he gives us some examples. He says, look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap or gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? You know, it's really interesting. One of the lies that money gives us is that if you have money, then you'll have security. But Jesus says, no, that's not true. Look at the birds. If he were to say in our world, he'd say, look at the birds. They don't, they don't have nine to five jobs. They don't have bank accounts and they don't have 401ks. But you know what? They're never worried about life. Their life is secure. And if if God so values a little bird, how much more does your heavenly father value you? How much more is he willing to give you security? He goes on. He says, uh, and why are you anxious about clothing? Verse 28, consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. The other promise of money is this, that money will give you prestige, that will make you look good, that will make you beautiful. Everyone will look at you and be like, ah. Oh. But Jesus says, no, that's not true either. Because all money gives you is this facade, this veneer. He says, but look at the lilies of the valley. They don't go shopping. They don't get to the latest sales. But you know what? God dresses them in finer array than all of King Solomon's the greatest king in Israel. Money doesn't give you prestige. It doesn't give you beauty. Jesus does. Jesus, Jesus wants you to know that you have so much more when you pursue the kingdom than when you pursue the world. He's trying to tell us this, that when we live for money, we choose a God we think we control rather than the God who is in control. So ultimately, it's an issue of control. The truth is you never have it. It's either money or it's God. Money really doesn't have control. It just gets you out of control. God is the one who's truly in control. So here's what I want to close with. There's three kinds of people in this room. One kind, man, you need to stop making God just a priority in your life. You need to make God everything in your life. And God is calling you to deeper steps of faith. For some of you, that means actively pursuing him through generosity. For some, that means that you need to start tithing because you haven't. For some, that means you need to start being generous towards, whether it's a nonprofit or, or an organization that you know you need to support or a person you need to hurt or help or serve. And God's been putting that on your heart, but you've always held off for some reason. And you need to move towards that obedience. The second group of people is this. And you need to be financially free. Jesus isn't your master because your debt collectors are. You can't be a master of money unless Jesus is a master of you. You gotta give it up to him. And the last group is this. And this is the most important group. Those of us who need to give everything to Jesus. You need to give your life to Jesus. Because giving your life over to money or giving your life over to this world only yields worry and sorrow. But Jesus has so much more for you. Money didn't die for you. This world didn't die for you. Jesus did. Uh, in Jesus' day, um, the merchants, whenever they would... Uh, finish a sale, they would give a receipt. And on the bottom of the receipt, if they received full payment, they would write the word, Telestai, Telestai. And that meant paid in full, paid in full. Jesus, on, his, on the cross, with his last breath, says these words, and we have recorded in the New Testament. Jesus says, it is finished. That's how it's translated for you and I. But in the Greek New Testament, it doesn't read it as finished. It says the words, Telestai. 
paid in full. I'd be lying to you if I told you that the greatest debt in my life was my student loans. No, the greatest debt in my life was my sin. That was the one debt I could never hope to pay back. And let me tell you, your sin is the greatest debt that you can never hope to pay back, except for it's already been paid for. Jesus spoke it 2,000 years ago, paid in full. So why are you carrying that debt? 